Welcome to Establishing Shots, the podcast about the art, craft and business of filmmaking. I'm Nick Hilton. My guest this week is Victoria Mapplebeck, a documentary filmmaker and teacher of documentaries at Royal Holloway. But before we get onto that, a quick shout out for our partners at Cineview, which is a great film website and does loads of documentary coverage. For instance, Martin Conterio's five-star review of Peter Jackson's new visually groundbreaking World War I restoration picture, They Shall Not Grow Old. So visit them at cine-view.com for all the latest news and reviews. Now, here's our conversation. So I'm here with Victoria Mapplebeck, who is a documentary filmmaker who's just releasing, or has just released, I should say, a new short film called Miss Cool. She's also a reader at Royal Holloway University in Digital Arts and convenes their MA documentary program. So you all have a long list of experiences in this part of the industry in terms of teaching and producing work. We're here primarily to talk about Mist Cool, which is a 20 minutes or so short documentary about your son, Jim. Can you give me the very kind of brief pressy of what um, what the film is about? I can. So it is a, uh, a sequel to a film I made for Film London in 2015 where I bring to life a whole uh, text thread that was buried in a vintage Nokia between myself and Jim's dad. And that film charts very much the whole story of um, raising a child alone, but from my perspective, using those text threads as a way of exploring the story. And it ends with Jim at about 11, when he's sort of, I don't know if you remember the final sequence, but he's he's sort of running down a hill in Brockwell Park with, with his, his car. car. Yeah, and the sequel, I guess, is, is as Jim got older and um, he hit 13, and he asked me for the first time, really, that he wanted to kind of make contact with his dad. And I'd always thought that that might happen like more when he got older, a bit more like when kids are adopted and perhaps tracked down a biological parent. And I thought he'd be more like 18. And so that Miss Call was about Jim almost convincing me, you know, about that that was the right thing and that he and that he was able that he had the maturity, I guess, to be able to handle that. And there was a lot of, uh, I guess, trying to manage his expectations because I was worried that we would reach out and that we would get no response. And I was obviously worried about how Jim would find that and be able to deal with potentially no response if we did make that contact again. So, yeah, I think the film is about charting that sort of story arc, an emotional arc about how do you make contact with an absent dad who's been gone so long you know he was he was there was 12 years where we weren't in contact and then I suppose very much the films are fascinated by the way that we use phones now a lot of the times to have those really big emotional dialogues that perhaps once we might have been having more face to face so given the fact that that was the phone was going to be the cipher for for that kind of first communication with his dad. I think the film explores that. How do we do that? Do I call him? Do I send a text? What do I write? And of course, I think that's a big part of the storyline which you see on screen, which is me and Jim working out what do you put in that first text. And just to point in the direction of the kind of press release headline which Mm. is the I guess the way that these films are both 160 characters Mm. and Miss Cool are being sold is that they're shot on iPhones and it's sort of and now I've seen a lot of films that are shot on iPhones I think things like Tangerine there was a was it a Park Chan Wook or someone yeah and then the Soderbergh's Unsane which was just last year right 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 I didn't even didn't even see that one and it's always felt a wee bit gimmicky to me it seems seems like you only do it for the publicity you hamstring yourself technically yeah but this felt like there was more of a purpose to it maybe is that fair yeah i think there's a nice synergy isn't there when it's when it's very much about our phone life in terms of the way our, we live our lives through our phones and the way that those stories are archived in the phone and then i like the idea of, of the phone itself bringing that story to life and so that i think there is a nice synergy um in that this film is so much about phones on every level from how you can use them to record and bring that story to life, but also the way that we use phones to kind of curate and share stories of our life. So I think that that synergy is an important one. 
and I'd I made a leap, I guess, with the film London film. So before then, when I was a freelance documentary filmmaker and I was working in television, and that was my main day job, I would have a kit that was probably six or seven thousand pounds worth of kit and radio mics and external lenses, and you are a very visual one woman woman band, and you certainly couldn't film discreetly. You know, I would be wearing a kind of kind of brace and you know it was all bells and whistles and I love the spontaneity of shooting with a phone I think it's completely transformed how I film so for a start I do what I often say to students you know use your camera like a sketchbook and collect really great footage you don't always have to know what it's for but there isn't like a kind of conventional shoot so that whole production process which feels really traditional to me now that were, you know, when I began in the 90s in documentary, there were, there were shoot weeks, you know, you had a kind of two week shoot or a six week shoot and you weren't filming in that kind of rolling way. Whereas now, you know, I'll have times where I'm literally filming every day for a week um, and, you, and you, you were able to film in that much more spontaneous way. And then the, thing, the other thing I've loved is being able to film candidly. So, you know, on the current project, able to film in hospitals and in waiting rooms without you know you've got people but you're not overtly filming and you get some really kind of beautiful moments and in 160 characters and Miss Cool you know I'm filming a lot on buses and on tubes because that's where I am when I'm picking up those text messages so I think it captures that but again without people really noticing they're totally absorbed in their phones and they don't realize that you could be watching a film on your phone you could be or and even if they're aware that you're filming people think you're shooting selfies so um Sean Baker you know when he was making Tangerine talked about the advantage of quite often when he was shooting in downtown LA without permits that people just thought he was out Mm. with a bunch of mates and that you're shooting kind of home movie selfie footage so you kind of look like an amateur but hopefully you're shooting like a professional but it in terms of documentary access um it makes a huge difference you know so I don't think I could go back there are there are limitations obviously and sound is one of the biggest challenges but I don't think I ever want to go back to shooting with like a conventional kit Mm. there's a shot in the the first of the two films 160 characters where you're I think in turbine hall in the tape model and I was just thinking god what a nightmare to go in there with Mm. even a small sort of Mm. prosumer camera Mm. but you know we're all so accustomed to seeing people taking photographs in galleries and that sort of thing yeah especially when the means of distribution is predominantly online Mm. and you're watching it on a tiny screen maybe on a phone maybe on a laptop the, you know, the resolution issues that have historically been there aren't really there. Yeah. You know, a lot of the limitations technologically are yeah. eroding. And I, and I thought the films, you know, the films looked great. And in a way, do you think documentaries can get away with it in a, in a way that narrative cinema maybe can't because because of the limits of... Well, I, I don't know, actually. I think um, Tangerine, which in a way is shot in that almost verite way so it has it has a slightly documentary vibe in the way that it's shot but Tangerine uh, is, sh- is shot with a huge amount of accessories it is very expensive it is they were using external it. lenses and they had a kind of mixing desk so yeah they would have had a much much bigger kind of amount of kit Unsane I think you see the limitations I think that was shot on the 7 and it's quite murky Mm. Uh, because it's in it's in a kind of insti- she's in a mental asylum and it's in kind of institutionalized and they weren't using additional lighting I don't think it, it, I realize it works very nicely in that kind of high sunshine I mean I think Sean Baker calls it a kind of pop verite look and I know exactly what he means mm. so it's very bright saturated colors and again because the lens is so limited um, it flattens everything so there's no kind of depth in terms of foreground and background everything's just kind of rather flat but again I kind of you learn to sort of embrace that look um, and I personally really like it and I remember there was a really defining moment when 160 characters got into the London Film Festival in 2015 so it was playing an NFT one with all the other film London films that, that had been selected and it like it really stood up. It was amazing watching it on a on a big screen. And I don't think anybody noticed, you know, any difference. And I I was really chuffed because there was a lot of film London dramas that had been made for like twenty thirty grand, 
and I only got two grand out of them to make it. So, and it really stood up. And I remember thinking, great, you know. A last question on the subject of yeah. the boring subject of iPhones. Yeah. I feel like low light is the is the, obviously the difficult thing yeah. where the the ISO yeah. is ramped up to yeah. compensate and it gets noisy. Mm. Have you noticed any difference? You shot the f- the first of these two films on the iPhone six and yeah. the second on the iPhone X, which I'm told you have to call ten. I yeah, think, apparently. Yeah. Um, do you notice a difference? Has, has, the, has yeah. the technology getting better? So um, I think the iPhone ten is better in low light. So when I was filming in the, with all the hospital stuff this year. And uh, they let me film my radiotherapy sessions. You can imagine that's in a kind of low lit room with those kind of red lights. That would have not looked great on the six, mm-hmm. but on the ten looked looked fine. Mm-hmm. So that's been the advantage of the ten, I think, over the um, over the six. It was funny. I was showing both films to my students, and they felt they could see a massive difference. These annoying little yeah. annoying tech techie. Scenes. Yeah, I, I don't I don't feel it's huge, but they they instantly felt I they could I see like the difference of quality. Yeah. As someone who's a prospective purchaser of an iPhone X, or yeah, X10, I, I didn't I saw that and didn't think there was no any great difference. You're not sponsored by Apple, don't anyway. No, support your... no, didn't get anything out of Apple. But presumably, people like Soderbergh and Sean Baker are getting yeah doing some some sort of work there. Apparently, they're quite. Um, it's quite hard getting sponsorship out of Apple. Mm, um, so perhaps yeah, the big fancy directors do get freebies, but we 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 actually I don't think we tried on the on Miss Call Little Dot Studios who made it bought me. Uh, they were buying a ten anyway, and they let me use it for the production. And then on this current film, I just I was due an upgrade anyway. So yeah. And you can presumably file it as a tax, tax yeah. business expense. These. Yeah. And so the only expense really is the little bits of accessories. So you know, I use like a kind of stabilizer that was like about right. 180 quid. I use external mics again; they're like 40 quid a pop. So it's not huge. I'm just just aware that we've committed the cardinal sin of podcasting, which is referring in the conversation to something we said off mic. Yeah. And you've alluded to your current project. Yeah. Can you just very briefly fill fill in the, the blank there? What are you working on right this minute? Yeah, so right in the middle of the edit of Miss Call, uh, three days before Christmas last year, I got called back for a repeat mammogram, just a kind of, uh, just a normal screening mammogram. And I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, so I didn't have any lump, I didn't have any symptoms. It was picked up with the mammogram. And um, I quite quickly because I think I have sort of discovered this um, way of dealing with difficult news and difficult experience in life is to kind of look at them through a lens. I find that makes it easier somehow or, or is cathartic. So I quite quickly decided that I was going to make that my next project. And um, so I've shot like 30 hours worth of footage of the whole treatment cycle, which has been sort of nine months of... Uh, operations and chemotherapy and radiotherapy and it's been commissioned by uh, Charlie Phillips at The Guardian so it's going to be uh, yes a film for him and also a virtual reality project as well. Can we talk a little bit about funding because you've mentioned Film London already yeah and now we're talking about The Guardian yeah in terms of getting these projects funded you've got a lot of different sm- small sources yeah I mean how do you think the funding bodies are handling the current documentary market or maybe it's market is not quite the right word documentary filmmakers like yourself how are they being supported by british funding bodies i find it really really hard i i find the whole funding system very difficult unless you're a kind of named director in the first place Uh, and i think that was why i began to switch to um Crowdfunding never would work for me because I wasn't really making a kind of campaign or issue-based documentary. Uh, but it's why it's another reason why I embrace smartphone filmmaking is because no funding is no excuse anymore, and that you're, I was certainly able, particularly on the cancer film, I didn't have to wait around for the funding to start making it. I could kind of get going on it and start shooting every week, every day. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's. I think that's my way around it. I mean, I have, I still do apply for the bigger funding, and I'm hoping that you know I will kind of get back to that. And I have actually just got some big funding to make the virtual reality film. But yeah, I I kind of 
I also like the editorial freedom of really low budget funding. You know, the bigger the funding you get, the more all over it they are, you know. In terms of these these short documentaries, you obviously need funding in order to work professionally. But how much kind of budget do you do you need? Is this a case of just covering the cost of your work or or where does the where do you spend the money on really? I think those the kind of new sort of documentary shorts commissions like The Guardian, you know, the one I've got at the moment is 5,000. I think they can sometimes go up to about 10. The Real Stories Commission for Miss Call is 10,000. So I think even if you get those short form bits of funding, they're pretty small. So I think, yeah, you have to, um, you're often as a director, not, I mean, it's a good job I've got a day job, really. You know, in a way, my academic career means that I don't have to take a fee. But I sort of worry about younger filmmakers as like, how do you do it? And that real, the real stories, I, I went on the uh, YouTube page and saw mm. their kind of the other stuff they, they produce, which mm. seems is on, it was captivating, but it's seems to be mainly like medical mysteries. Yeah. A very, um, sort of very kind of late night Channel 4. Yeah. Um, Channel 5 maybe even. Yeah. Stuff. I think they let missed it. it. was quite one of my worries when I was first commissioned was feeling like, well, I'm not, I don't think stylistically it's going to be that kind of film. And I think they let mine be a kind of wild card. I think that the majority, um, you know, they're kind of hoping to make their money back in terms of sales. So, in fact, we don't own... The contract was quite hard on that film because we don't we don't own... They own it forever. Um, and I think that's why the style is poppier for the bulk of them because I think they're hoping that those will be more sellable. But I did... I had an amazing time. Adam G was brilliant. I knew him a little bit before he commissioned the film. And he was massively supportive because we're not, none of us knew where that narrative was going to go. You know, it was a kind of unfolding narrative in every sense. And we didn't know whether his dad was going to come back at all and how the film would shape up. And I thought he was really kind of supportive through that process. I think it was helped that he'd seen 160 characters and really liked it. So I think stylistically, he kind of knew what I would want to do. But no, I was really pleased that he there was no attempt to shape it to be like the rest of the series. It felt like it could kind of exist as a bit of a, of a wild card in that commissioning style. And I know he's very pleased with it, and obviously he's very pleased with all the other films, but the, yeah, it feels different. Both these short films and the project that you're working on at the moment are very like intensely personal as mm. documentaries. Mm. Do you think that's something... You, your work requires or do you think you could do something more estranged from your personal reality for it so for a long time when I was a freelance self shooting director I would sort of make a documentary a year at channel four um and I felt like I've always been attracted to quite emotional subjects so my first film ever for channel four was about the sons and daughters of the Bader Meinhof group and was sort of looking at that period of German politics, but what it was like for the kids. So lots of my families are about family, about films that are about family dysfunctions or how, you know, if I think about, they've often got mothers. I realised that I made several films. I made a, a film for Channel 4 on the Killshaws who were involved in this whole alleged sort of internet baby scandal in the early 2000s. So I'm often, yeah, bad mums or or the kind of legacy of motherhood was quite a lot of theme. But yeah, so it's only been since 2015 that in a way I've stopped looking at other people's sort of dysfunctional personal lives and brought my own to the fore. And it, you know, it has been quite strange actually to sort of turn the camera on myself. And I kind of feel after this cancer film that's probably enough of it I feel like that mm. the, there's almost a trilogy of the films and I've been intensely personal I've had a lot going on you know I've had in terms of story arcs and drama I think there was plenty to kind of mine but I'm sort of yeah looking forward to going back to looking out and uh, going back to kind of doing observational portraiture of like other people's lives and stories rather than my own but it weirdly I can't help feeling that they feel like my best work Mm. So I'm never very keen. I'm really proud of the films I did in the early days, but I never feel any great desire to go and watch them again or to... I do teach with them sometimes, but yeah, I think the autobiographical ones are probably <clears throat> probably my favourite ones. Mm. There's this debate that kind of recurs in journalism, I 
and I, I guess in other industries that I'm not privy to, which is about this question of people commissioning personal essays and drawing very heavily from people's personal experience, sort of wringing them of mm. their of the, these kind of essential stories. Mm. And the dis- discussion often centers around the idea that it's very gendered and that, mm. that it's women who are the tellers of these kind of p- writers of personal essays. Mm. You know, men get to go off and do reportage and or mm. make do- documentaries about genocide in indonesia and then mm. you know women are much more likely to to do these kind of reflective personal histories do you think do you sense that at all i mean obviously you 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 just said you're, these are your favorite work mm. but i'm just wondering whether you sense that it's maybe it's something that male filmmakers are more reluctant to engage with for better or for worse i certainly feel like there's more women who've made those kind of autobiographical documentaries in the last sort of five years or so um, but I can think of some guys. There was a Storyville, and I'm really hopeless because I can forget the title. But uh, his mother had had a family when she was much younger and then was estranged from her kids. And he tracks down her kids and sort of confronts his mom as to, as to what happened. So they have, I have seen some really good documentaries by guys that have also been quite personal and about family. But I suppose women, you know... We have kids, and perhaps those, particularly those kind of family portraits, um, that's our lives. We're kind of living those lives more. Um, you know, I think the films are massively about motherhood, really, and the sort of legacy of motherhood and the implications of doing it completely on your own when you're the kind of lone sole parent. So, um, yes, I guess those themes are perhaps more resonant to women um but i'd hate to think you know there's the the sort of gender dynamic of i've also seen some brilliant you know there's june giovanni but there's like brilliant you know women filmmakers and journalists who've worked on the front line who've made incredibly important political films so i'd hate that cliche of that's for the guys and that just the personal family stuff is for for women i'd like to think that women filmmakers can make great films inside the domestic space and outside in the the world at large. And, and when you're teaching documentary mm. filmmaking, would you advise your students to make these sort of films when they're budding, when you know, when they're young filmmakers? Is that you know, there's always a fear, I guess, if you have a really compelling family story that you spend it very early, this, this, the telling of it very early in your career, when maybe taking some time to learn the craft and learn the from an abstract perspective before you start to you know delve into these very personal stories which you can only to some extent you can keep telling them over and over again you can repeat it and retry it but you can only really um, i think emotionally like tell these stories once with any kind of sincerity would you advise your students to go down these sort of very introspective paths or or do you just do you say do whatever takes your interest no i do one of the things i'll often say when i'm teaching because you get the cliches all the time so you know the we'd all our hearts would always sink at they'd gone to find a tattoo parlor and they were doing a whole you know that would come up at Royal Holloway so much with the undergrad students you know and I used to say to them try and make a film about something that keeps you awake at night or preoccupies you during the day because if you're not thinking about it and you don't give a shit then nobody else is going to and I often think like the best student works that I've supervised and, and sort of supported students in making have been ones where they've got some stake in the project. There's some kind of authorship. So it doesn't have to be autobiographical, but that they are kind of authored works, you know. And then I think in terms of, yes, I think it does take quite a lot of filmmaking skill to pull off an autobiographical film because I think one of the most important things you need to do is for it not to be self-indulgent and that often needs a kind of distance and a self-awareness but I think you can still have that at a young age so one of my favorite films is Carol Morley's Alcohol Years which I think she made in her kind of mid-20s and if you've seen it it's the one where she puts an ad in time out and she says uh, she was a real wild child in Manchester in the 80s in the kind of hacienda years and she puts an ad in time out saying anyone that slept with me between 1983 and 86 please respond to this ad and then she films a variety of men and women that 
you know, she slept with during these kind of wild years. And it's really brilliant. So I think it's one of her best films. But it's made right at the beginning. I mean, she subsequently made, you know, feature films and lots of other shorts. And I, I do think it's got a kind of rawness and a brilliance that it's one of her best films and was definitely made, I think, like I say, she was probably in her mid-twenties when she made it. So if I were a um, an aspirant documentary filmmaker mm-hmm. in my mid-twenties, which I'm, this is not free um, careers advice, <laughs> how would you recommend I go about it? I mean... It's very hard for someone to make a living in documentary filmmaking unless they're going through, going to work their way up the rungs in mm. at Channel Four or the BBC mm. and wait for the opportunities to sort of work on yeah. budgeted projects. Yeah. If you wanted to step outside and be an like independent yeah. documentary filmmaker, yeah. how is that compatible with living in London? I think one of the things um, I would recommend, and I suppose it comes out of my teaching, is is learn a skill a kind of transferable skill around that industry, whether that be shooting or editing. And most of my students tend to uh, do commercial gigs as an editor or a kind of researcher or a producer or a, a cinematographer. And then it pays... The nice thing about freelance is that then you're in control of your time more. And it means you can t- then take three months out to develop your own project And I think um, you definitely want to avoid writing a million and one versions of your proposal because that's not how you get skilled as a filmmaker. You want to make it. So now that, I mean, you don't have to work on a smartphone, but now that basically shooting and editing has become much more accessible and much cheaper, there are no excuses to why you couldn't be shooting continually you know even around your day job you know you can shoot your own project at the weekend even if you've been working on as a paid you know cinematographer all the way through the week Um, and most of my students that's kind of how they do it and then um, you make your film you then I think the key is what's your festival and online launch strategy And I think that's changed massively, even in the last five years. So, you know, when I, I I was such a learning curve when I put 160 characters online, because I actually delayed it a year. So it was at the London Film Festival. And then I thought, oh, you do the festivals first, because they, they'll be, you know, they'll turn it, they'll turn it away if it's online. And of course, so many of the festivals now don't require premier status. So short of the week were brilliant and I recommend them highly to students. And um, for 160 characters where I had the freedom because I owned it. So I was able to put it on as many online platforms as I wanted. I'm not able to do that with Miss Call because Real Stories own it. But, um, you know, it went on. I should have put it on short of the week straight away. But it was amazing when it went on short of the week because the same curating team know a lot of the Vimeo used to work at Vimeo and so there's a great link there so quite a lot of the short of the week films get a Vimeo stuff pick which 106 characters did and then suddenly the 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 online hits go through the roof um and then it's been picked up all over the place you know it's been on Slate <clears throat> it's been on Atlantic Selects it's been on Omeletto Omeletto have got huge reach I think it had like 600,000 hits on Omeletto alone. So it's had a com- combined viewership, I think, of about a million and a half hits, which Miss Call, I don't think, will get up to anything like that because I'm not free to put it elsewhere, which is a bit of a shame. It strikes me that documentaries might be the part of cinema as an industry that is the most obvious beneficiary of the move towards streaming. Because mm. before, in terms of features, you, you were getting you know, a dozen mainstream theatrical releases in, in the UK a year, probably they got that got yeah. a few screens. Whereas now, I mean, it seems striking that Netflix and Amazon are paying quite a lot of money for, for mm-hmm. documentaries because people like documentaries. They probably don't want to pay £15 to see one at the cinema, but yeah. they do like one. Do you, do you think that the emergence of Netflix and Amazon and others as titans in, in terms of film financing is a positive for documentaries? I do think it's a positive and I think that I've certainly in terms of Netflix and the kind of documentaries they're commissioning 
I've seen a lot more interesting stuff than I would. I wouldn't turn to kind of like broadcast platforms anymore for looking at really good documentary features. So uh, I like that casting of John Marie Bennett. I forget the, the title of it. But again, it was a really interesting sort of formal approach to making a documentary. So now I think they're, they're kind of taking the most risks. Just finally, Miss Cool is already available. It came out in May on, yeah, yeah. on Real Stories. It's coming out in some other fashion in it's winter? The, the plug at the moment is because it's been shortlisted, shortlisted for the AHLC Research and Film Awards, their social media category. That prize is going to be given and selected at BAFTA on Thursday. So right. that's that's the thing that we've got right. coming up Right, the people who are listening moment. can go to, they'll just search for Missed Miss Yeah, if they YouTube put in, yeah, Miss Cool, uh, Real Stories, it would it would take them right to the YouTube channel. And, and yeah. And they'll be able love. to see your next work in VR and on The Guardian, but not the yes. VR and The Guardian. <clears throat> the short film on The Guardian should be, should be on The Guardian website early next year. And then I'm going to be working on the virtual reality film that goes with it over the next few months and then I'm hoping they will tour festivals and exhibition spaces together from summer 2019. Right and are you convinced that VR is the future of documentary filmmaking? I do really love it. Um, I had said to a friend of mine called Catherine Allen who's like very big in VR, she made some of the early BBC VR projects I'd said, if I had my time over again, I'd so be doing VR. And she went, it's so not too late, you know, just you come on. You are literally doing it. Yeah, yeah, get on, you know, it doesn't matter. There's not, there's not age, there's no age barrier to making VR. And I, in a way, part of getting involved was to know the genre really well. So I did spend a couple of years at festivals watching everything. Lots of VR nonfiction, but also like the whole gamut uh, and reviewing it, I've written written about VR for various magazines. So I sort of feel, but it's still quite scary. You know, this is going to be the first VR project and I've got a great team around me, but this will be the first VR project that I'm directing. But no, I think if as a documentary filmmaker, you are trying to move your audience in some way, how extreme that is in virtual reality, the fact that you can absolutely put your viewer in that space, in that journey, in a really emotional, sort of visceral way, is a massive game changer. It really is. And I've been moved by good. I've seen a lot of bad VR, and I think even the bad VR is kind of fascinating because it's it's a grammar that's still being written. So even where it fails is really interesting. But in the good VR, there was a very good um, National Theatre, National Film Board of Canada collaboration called Draw Me Close. There was a memoir of a theatre director whose mum was dying in stage four cancer and him looking after her. And it's 12 minutes long and I've never been so blown away by a film. I kind of still, I, I call it film, but you'd probably call it VR rather than a film because it's not flat film. But I've never, ever been as blown away by something in such a short amount of time. So yeah, it's kind of, why would I not want to have a go in that medium when I've had such a kind of profound response to it myself as a kind of, as a user, as a as a viewer? Well, I'll need to buy a headset for yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for speaking pleasure. to me. Pleasure, pleasure. Very nice speaking to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and please leave us a review there if you've listened this far. If you've listened this far, you're clearly a huge fan. Please leave us a five-star review and say some kind words and it helps people find us. And you can also listen on Spotify, tune in, all those various places. And if you're interested in advertising on the podcast, drop me a line at nick at podopods, that's P-O-D-O-T-P-O-D-S dot com and we can have a chat about that. Thanks for listening and speak to you soon.